I am Jeff Foxworthy, and welcome to Gamekeeper Podcast. If you want to learn more about farming for wildlife and habitat management, then buddy, you are in the right place. Join the Gamekeeper crew direct from Mossy Oak Land Enhancement Studio as they discuss the latest wildlife and habitat management practices, news, and of course, hunting. There's no telling what you'll learn, but I'm going to tell you, I bet it's interesting. Enjoy. We're live in three, two, one. Here we are, West Point, Mississippi. Summer's getting started. We're all piled in the Gamekeeper studio, and I'm looking around. We got a motley crew today. I take offense to that. Yeah, Toxie's down there at the end, and and we've got Ronnie Cuss Strickland sitting in here with us. Hey, I was minding my own business. I brought Toxie a bottle of barbecue sauce, and he ran me in here. So that's right. I'm not sure why I'm here, but I'm glad to be here. This is this is a big deal right here. It well, is. <laughs> we need you for the discussion. Yeah, we yes, do. You yes. got. You're going to add a lot of value to this. And Dudley, you got a smile on your face. Well, it's just one of my favorite times of year. Well, you just been on vacation. Uh, not really. Well, you were gone for what, four or five a couple, days. Just what a couple con- days. <clears throat> what do you consider vacation? Is that like downtime? I bet Dudley didn't get much downtime. It was like the lake. Vacation. Well, we went we went on a family reunion trip with the Phelps clan to Lake Oconee. We had a good time. That's a beautiful lake. Yeah. yeah. Did you listen to some Yacht Rock radio? You know, I, request, I requested Yacht Rock, but my aunt put it on the, the vinyl channel, the oldies or whatever. That's close. That's close. You catch it, hey, did you catch any bluegills? We fished a lot and did not have much luck. I, I couldn't believe it. Yeah. Hey, it was a full moon and everything. Yeah. My daddy's looking down at me and my fishing prowess, shaking his head, going, where did I go wrong? I am, <laughs> I am not a good yeah. fisherman. His, his daddy could catch a, for now, he'd catch fish out of a bucket. Oh, he was something. Yep. So looking over here uh, to the right on the guest couch, we've got none other than Dr. Bronson Trickling. Boom. <laughs> And it's been a while, Bronson. It has been. It's been a been a few months. It seems like I just got back from a little R and R as well, Dudley. I caught some uh, caught some red snapper. Oh, okay. Wow. And every year I do that, I realize how much older and out of shape <laughs> I'm getting from reeling those things up. And and now the frustration of I think about twenty five percent or so of the fish we almost landed get eaten by a shark yeah Yeah. you pull it up about 100 feet and you can see it and it's close and the shark comes up and takes it so that was was frustrating yeah (laughs) yeah that was fun wow they're everywhere Mm -hmm. yeah they are so that's got to affect the snapper quota in some kind of way oh they don't you know they don't i mean they can't keep up with that but that's that's a dead fish yeah, that's right. Since they put snapper quotas on, and I'm not an expert, but I listen to people that go, there's not a big shortage of snapper right now. So, yeah, I think it's turned around. I think the regulatory measures, <laughs> yep, t- five plus years ago, I think mm-hmm. they're working. It just takes time, but I think that population's rebuilding. So, just like everything that we talk about in here, it's amazing fish can be ma- in the Gulf can be managed. That's right. And there's biologists like you, Bronx, people that have studied it and are know what's going on it's Mm -hmm. again and again it blows my mind i mean i remember thinking about how could people with sticks and strings and a musket wipe out bison it's not possible or shoot our turkeys down so low they're almost extinct and and they did and they could and how could how could people fishing affect especially you know gulf fishing would be or saltwater be for me like speckled trout maybe redfish stuff like that and they did yeah, you know, and so it takes what we talk about, you know, the the system checks and balances. It has to be if we love this stuff. So that's amazing. That's right. how you would never think they could catch enough red snapper. You reel them up out of a hundred feet to make a difference, but they do. Mm-hmm. I'm just glad we've got. I mean, Mississippi State and other universities like Mississippi that are putting out young people that are going to work for these conservation departments that are able to uh, make scientific. Uh, have opinions or mm-hmm. have studies, have research that, where they can make scientific decisions about what's going on. That's what? right. They they care about the resource. They enjoy every aspect of it. Monitoring, going out and doing those surveys, they get a kick out of that. Enjoy it, and then taking it back and making you know regulations. That's that's what uh, that's what they love. That's what they devoted their life to do. Hmm. I, I bet that's a sore subject down on the Gulf Coast though when they start regulating how many fish a guy can catch. Oh, that's a big deal, especially the snapper thing. The 
you know, the drama between the commercial people and the, and the uh, recreational folks. There's, yeah, I mean, that, that's like a two-hour-long mm. rabbit hole conversation. Well, this, look, yeah. the one, they just got to realize, I mean, that's a tough who gets priority of this and that, but they got all, they're all in the same boat. It's, it's, not, it's in no one's best interest to lose the resource or to severely hurt more the commercial person more than anybody. Because the you know, the recreational guy flip over and catch something else. But so, we, so we're all in it together. You and your grandsons are y'all y'all out there on the pond oh, a, a lot these days. Yeah, well, you know, we've been catching some brim, but uh, a year and a half ago, whenever it was, I stocked it with three hundred and fifty seven inch fingerling catfish, and been feeding and feeding, just leaving it alone, not even looking at the pond. Test the water every once in a while. And I can't catch one of them catfish on a bet. I'm telling you, it's the most humbling thing. My dad was a pretty good fisherman. He taught me a lot of stuff. And I physically can't catch one of those catfish on a rod and reel. You do can't, you, do you can't you call your buddy. You I think so. I hadn't been there. When the feeder goes off, there's so much r- rippling. You right. can't really tell because of where the sun sits out there. Your buddy Dater can't help you out on that? I was thinking about calling him. But anyway, I, I resorted to a trot line. 10 days ago, and I had them boys out there and, and showing them because they didn't know anything about a trot line. They, that's a good life skill. You need to mm-hmm. have it. So we put that trot line out, and I baited it with liver. It was the closest thing I could find. You know, it may not be the best bait. But anyway, Matt was up there. He was getting the hang of it. Cranky, the youngest one, he wouldn't touch that liver. And I was like, what's wrong with you? He said, hey, Pop, everybody's different. I can't handle, <laughs> I can't handle that liver. But anyway, we checked it the next day, not a fish. Not a catfish. The last time this happened, I talked. I was talking to Toxie, and he and him and this old trapper told me. He said, "You got otters," and I went, "No offense, but I've never seen an otter out there." And I got the trapper back out there, and he caught nine in two. Weeks. Oh, they'll wipe them up. Nine will wipe your pond out. He he said when you feed them like that, he said you're just putting them on a silver platter. And he said an otter, an an adult otter, will eat five to six and a half pounds of fish. A day yep. per otter. That they just mm-hmm. wiped you out. So. Yeah, and I'm told that sometimes that they'll just kill them just for the sport of killing them. Really? And kill them and just eat the brains. Mm-hmm. Bronson, have you ever heard that? I, I've heard of it as well. I I don't know for certain. They're bad. Mm-hmm. You know when. Remind Don, me not to take a nap on the pool bank. Yeah. Well, yeah. Then so <laughs> you know when Don and Barry were promoting. If you really want to grow big bass, you've got to put a fence around that pond to keep the otters out. And that well, was one of their requirements. It's crazy how they could be in a pond. Like I said, they probably are. I've got the pond behind my house, and I've got all kind of holes in the dam and beavers built stuff. And I've seen a couple of, like, nutri rat stuff. I mean, I, but I look I'm back there at daylight and dark all the time. I go back there at night, flip on the spotlight. I can never, I never, it's like nothing's there. It's crazy. But you can see the work in the tracks, in the trails. They're slick, too. They, they, don't, are slick. they don't leave a slide, and they'll mm-hmm. carry that stuff off as... It's hard to find the sign. They call it a toilet or something like that. They'll drag that fish out. And yeah, a lot of times you can see the scales when yeah. they're crossing over the dam, the mm-hmm. fish oh, scales yeah. from their poop. That's my mm-hmm. story for the grandson. <laughs> we'll have to, otters ate them. Yeah, we'll have to do uh, We'll have to find somebody at Mississippi State that's an otter expert well, this, and learn about them. This topic today with him is another example. It's like when you start living your life on the land and you're a gamekeeper, it's like nature's trying to take away everything you do. It's crazy. It's not just one or two here and there. We're talking about a couple here, but we're going to talk mm-hmm. about a big one with him. Yeah. So, so look, why don't we start on down this road? Uh, we want to talk about, we want to learn about EHD. Mm-hmm. And first off, can you tell us what that stands for? Epizootic hemorrhagic disease. That's Is a mouthful. Say that fast ten times. I don't think I can. Yeah. So, Country Boy, 25 years ago, we found one, and they said it had blue tongue. Is that the same thing? Yeah, uh, yes and no. Okay. So it, it's within the same family of, of viruses. So there's hemorrhagic disease viruses and blue tongue viruses. And, and so instead of saying that it's all EHD, it's kind of been shortened just to say HD. You'll see that sometimes, HD. That just means within the family of hemorrhagic disease viruses. That's EHD as well as blue tongue. We can't tell if you find an affected deer or a dead deer we're going to have no idea. It takes a laboratory to determine what it was. So the manifestation right, of the right. virus is exactly the same. 
They die from the same cause. Pretty much, they yeah. They pretty much bleed to death. That's, that's exactly right. That's the hemorrhaging of the right. hemorrhagic disease. So that leads me to the next question. Well, are, what is the difference between the two as far as, you know, how, how does it spread? It, it spread the same way. So the, the flies, the midge right. flies? Right, it, It's uh, The uh, scientific name is Seculocoides, that is the genus, but basically it is a gnat or, or a noceum, and within that, you know, there's a lot of those different gnats, but the, there's, you know, one or two that specialize on deer. And so they are the vector of the disease. They're the ones that they get a blood meal on an affected deer, infected deer, and spread it like that. So that, that's the role that they play. Okay. I'm not an EHD expert, but, but I, you know, I'm, I'm a wildlife biologist, and I'm a deer biologist, and so this issue comes up all the time. But, you know, I'm not a virus expert by, by any uh, stretch of the imagination. But, but, but you did stay at Holiday Inn Express. <laughs> yeah, he did. Two nights in a row. Two nights in Two a row. Two nights in a row, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's getting to be about that time when we need to it start is. watching for it, isn't it? That's right. Because Fred Law, you know Fred. Yes. I mean, I saw him post a, a couple of days ago where he's found a couple of deer in, down in a pond that couldn't couldn't mm. get out and were struggling, and he was like, oh, goodness. Does yeah. he, anybody know what's going on? And everybody was saying blue tongue and EHD and that's Very well could South be. Alabama. A little early. Yeah, Bullock County, yeah, Alabama. Say, isn't it a bit early? A little early, yeah. but could be. Yeah. But he said it's been really dry and really hot down there. Yeah. So that uh, the conditions like that uh, aren't really affecting the deer. It would be affecting most likely the, the population levels of culicoides. So they're going to have a, a better hatch. You know, y'all talk about all the time about re recruitment and poult survival with turkeys and so forth. So some of these conditions are just more conducive to having a stronger hatch reproduction well, of these. So like a, a wet spring where there's a lot of water where they can reproduce? It, it's not as much. Uh, so don't think of a mosquito. It's not like having eggs in water. Mosquito needs to have that. It's more like mud. Okay. Things like that. So, you know, a, a really severe drought may be bad, and a really, really wet spring flooding in the delta may not be conducive either. It's kind of that in-between, mud-flat okay. kind, of, kind of environment. But probably, Bobby, I guess back to your question of why is it a, a big deal every year and, and so much misunderstanding about it, is in the South, I, I think this is just really interesting, and we've all learned a lot about viruses the, the past couple years. So this is a virus. And in the southern U.S., from Florida to Texas, uh, our deer herds are confronted with this virus every single year. You know, it might be a particular strain of it, may vary, but these viruses are circulating in the southeast all the time. Because of that, uh, deer build up an immunity so once the deer gets the disease, if they don't die from it, they're going to develop their immune system. They're going to develop the antibodies. And they're more or less for the rest of their life going to be immune to either the, the HD family of viruses or the blue tongue family of viruses. And does will even pass those antibodies on to their fawns. And so wow. our deer are just walking around with pretty good immunity unless they get the word, you know, from COVID, the novel virus, unless they get a novel strain of it. And so in the Southeast, we do have deer that die of EHD every single year, but the numbers are minuscule compared to other parts of the country where the virus is novel. And so that's the big difference when you get to the Midwest and the Iowa and the Illinois and Indiana and and those numbers are, are true where we lost 30% of our deer, 50% of our deer. That, that can absolutely happen. But it's because those deer have no immunity or no antibodies. They haven't been, they have had several generations of deer that have not been confronted with the virus. And so they suffer the acute form of it. And within, you know, three days, five days, something like that, they die. The others probably were, and there's probably some genetic element to this, were confronted with it and were able to live through it. And I'm just going to go back to our example with COVID. We all know situations where even within a family, some people had a hard time with the virus, unfortunately, 
Some people went to the hospital. Unfortunately, we all know some people that passed away. But, but a lot of people could, you know, get sick and handle the virus. Same way with the chronic form of EHD. These deer lived through it. They got a temperature. They felt bad. Uh, showed signals or signs like hoof sloughing. It's one of those things right. the biologists always ask on the heart or the hoofs. That is basically they were suffering from a temperature and feeling so bad, their, their fingernails stopped growing. Wow. And then when it started growing again, you see that line of demarcation mm -hmm. and, and it sloughs off. But anyway, the ones that lived through it, now they have immunity to it. And those does are going to pass it on to their fawns. Wow. And so then you might go five plus years or 10 years and not have any problem. And then all that immunity kind of goes away. Virus comes in again and you have a big outbreak. Okay. So one question I have is, is there, I'm not even going to say somebody said this it could be just wild still. Is there, is there uh, any consistency that it affects more does than bucks or more any particular size, weight, age that die? eat more easily or at all, or is it just non-discriminate? Toxie, there could be. I, I've never seen okay. that before. I've e Equal opportunity okay. killer. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Why, why is it worse in the Midwest as far as 30 to 50%? And we hear about it every day. Why up there more so than down here in it, the South? It's just that history of immunity. It's just that because that virus is not making it up there every single year, they aren't building up the antibodies or the, the resistance to it. And so, you know, again, it's like uh, getting confronted with COVID now after you've had COVID a few times versus the very first time you got it, it may may hit you harder. So, so go ahead. Well, yeah, and then, you know, human epidemiology or whatever uh, versus deer, but you know, typically what is so dangerous for us with any virus is not the virus itself, but our body's reaction to it. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that's similar with this. Is it the deer's reaction to it? Because, you know, so many times, um, even I remember older Dr. Miller saying, you know, the virus literally is your reaction to it. So that's why steroids or, you know, things like that uh, are so effective or help or whatever, keep your body from not, not overreacting to the virus. Yeah. I'm just wondering, is that, what happens with this virus in deer? What causes? I know, obviously, they hemorrhage, but mm -hmm. what other than that, what's going on? Um, the, the, the physiology is, is way over my head, uh, but just things like you, you have the hemorrhaging, <clears throat> and, of, of course, you're going to have ulcers on some of them. Right. Uh, I mean, it'll just be an awful look where half the tongue will look broken in two, just had this really intense ulcer. Uh, swelling, the, the sac around their heart will take on fluid, uh, congestion in the lungs, scarring, ulcers, and then scarring in the lungs. So I remember a buck we had in the, the deer pens a long time ago that uh, lived through EHD. He made it through that year, uh, but he died the following year, and necropsy just showed that EHD and the scarring in his rumen had just really diminished his capacity to, to process food effectively. So um, there's a lot of things, Toxie. That's that's a, a good question. And uh, a physiologist or a virus expert may pick up 20 different things of how it could, could impact a deer. Right. It's probably not a, a, a clear-cut answer here. <clears throat> I'm, there's a right and a wrong answer here. But if, you, if you've got a property and you encounter a deer that looks like it's got what you've just described and suffering, sh should a guy put it out of its misery or, or just say, man, that maybe that deer will live or? Um, legally, what you're supposed to do is uh, you've got to stand back and let it live. But what you can do is contact your state wildlife agency. Right. That's what and you could let them know that they can start monitoring. Do we have a, an outbreak in this region? And then if a conservation officer or someone came and saw that, they may choose to put it out of its misery. Right. But also keep in mind, uh, some of the deer, I don't know what fraction, 50% or 10%, but some of the deer that may be, you know, laying on the edge of the water, remember that they've got a temperature. Right. They're just hurting yeah. really bad and have right. a temperature. Some of those may live through it. Mm -hmm. So everyone you seeing, see laying down like that may not be destined for death, although a great majority, a good proportion of them yeah, will be. And, um, and so I'm, if they do make it, you know, if you 
if you took them out of the herd, then they don't have a chance to pass on the, the genes of being able to handle or the that. antibodies. So, right. Yeah. They don't yeah. spread the virus except through this gnat or fly or whatever. That's so right. what I was getting at, you're not like this super contagious deer is going to get all my other deer sick and there's no rush to have to kill them because of that. Right. You know, I mean, it's one more deer a fly might could eat from or whatever, but they probably, I mean, they had to get it somewhere besides the deer to start with to give it to deer. So I was just trying to put out there for people, don't panic that you need to kill this deer to protect your other deer either. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, let me back up. I may have misunderstood something, and I'm, I'm prone to do that. But mm-hmm. you talked about this virus traveling north. It ha- I remember we had a guy from Mississippi State, and I can't think of his name, but he was explaining how the army worms travel started in South Mississippi and, and, and rode the wind currents north. I didn't know that. They Learned march. That. That's why they call them army mm-hmm. worms. They march north. So is, does this virus start mm-hmm. in the south and move north every year? Yeah, and there's uh, – I think in five more years or 10 more years because of genetics and the way we can sample now, I think this will probably get mapped out a lot better. Uh, But there's probably some overwintering of the virus that occurs along the coastal bend, even maybe down into Central America or Mexico. And so I think it's, it's just a process of it's going to take time that there is a reservoir of the virus either in the, the gnat, the culicoides, that's not going through a freeze, that it can overwinter, or infected animals, but that's only going to be in these warmer environments where no freezing takes place. And then just that process of building and building, now the gnat goes to another deer, infects another gnat, feeds on that deer, and it just moves north in, in, in that regard. So... Uh, hard freeze like they have in the Midwest knocks it back. Knocks it back. So maybe, we I don't know how long it takes, maybe this crazy sudden, we'll see. I mean, there's I don't know if there's anybody propped up to actually get uh, quantifiable data from this out there, but you would think if that, that was like the fastest drop in recorded history, that's why we lost so many plants. Maybe the gnats and the stuff around, you know, didn't have time to acclimate, and it killed more of them than usual because it got below freezing, deadly cold, way further yeah. south than usual. You're talking about the crazy cold front yeah. we had back in December. Yeah. yeah. It killed that, everybody's and, food plots. Yeah, what I mean, it killed all It kills all kind of people. I tell you what, I'm coming back to places that we had, just off the subject, but that killed everything, just dead. And so our clover popped back in just a few spots here and there and here and there. And because it actually was harder on the native plants, there's clover everywhere from where I didn't think we had any at all because it eliminated competition. There's so much competition with our clover and stuff all around here. So just so you know, it was harder on other stuff than our plants. The only reason I was bringing it up for this is maybe we'll see less. I don't know. We'll find out yeah. before long. Time will tell. We're hearing people say they've you know, found it already. It's kind of early for that. Mm-hmm. But it'll be interesting. It's just going to be anecdotal. I heard of a big wave in Missouri. You know, Mark's got a lot of experience with it and, you know, people in the Midwest. But we'll see, you know. So do you know if there's any studies out there where a healthier population of deer can handle the virus better? Uh, so, you know, like an overpopulated yeah area that may not have quite as much food available how are they going to handle it compared to a well-checked deer herd in in good habitat is there is there a difference that you know of great question Uh, yeah that that is a good question and you know biological sense and conventional wisdom you would think that would be the case and i suggest you know that it is uh but to my knowledge i don't think there's any been any study confirming that and so even within a population that yeah. may be a more, little more nutritionally stressed, there's still winners and losers. So, you know, it, it would kind of be tough to document that, but, but it could be occurring at some level. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's obviously way more driven by regionality or further because you got people with the healthiest deer herds on the planet losing a bunch of them, but they're way further north. Mm-hmm. So I'm, just, I'm like, Dudley, I'm thinking, you know, malnutrition, heavily wooded, uh, summer areas without a lot of browse and deer come out of what summer looking pretty rough, ribs sticking out, that kind of thing. 
Would they may be more? I would, I would, I would guess, think so. I would guess they would be. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but but even in, our deer in our deer pens. I mean, we've lost deer in our deer pens that have all they can eat and have a vet if they yeah. sneeze. You know, to <laughs> yeah. treat them, and right. we still lose them. So, okay. Yeah. That's scary. Harry Jacobson had a neat uh, study years ago when, when he was here and. Uh, he was doing, um, I'm oversimplifying what, what all he was doing, but basically he had some deer from Michigan and we had some native, you know, around here, Mississippi deer. And um, the deer, we, and we had a bad EHD outbreak that year. And the adults that were essentially 100% northern, you know, most all of them died. And then the offspring of where it was, say, one parent was from Michigan and one of the parents was from Mississippi, about 50-50 of, of those died. Wow. So, yeah. And so we were talking earlier, Toxie, about years ago bringing deer from uh, up north down yep. here, and that, that's just one of those things Mother, mother Nature isn't going to allow that, you know. Nope. Interesting. Mm. That, that just speaks to exactly what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Unless they can develop a vaccine, which I doubt it's not enough. It takes so much money to develop the vaccine. I don't imagine it's commercially viable for deer. Does this affect cattle? There are uh, hemorrhagic diseases for cattle, but um, the viruses, I believe, are a little bit different, and I think there's overlap, and I think when you get further south, and when I mean further south, like Central America, I think there can be some more overlap there, but... Generally, and I may be wrong on this, but generally in the southeast, I, I don't think the same viruses that affect our deer are going to affect I, cattle. I, you know, growing up on a cattle farm, being around it, not a, just a ton, but some, I've never heard of it. Yeah. Uh, Do you remember when uh, EHD was first documented in deer? I, I don't remember the year, but I remember the story. Um EHD uh, that was actually the impetus for the creation of the Southeastern Cooperative Wildlife Disease Study. And so us biologist nerds, you might hear us always talking about squidus. Mm -hmm. we got to send some samples yes. to squidus. Yep. That's the Southeastern Cooperative Wildlife Disease Study at the University of Georgia. That was largely formed to identify this mystery killer, and it was actually termed Killer X. You know, we don't know what is killing all these deer and here and there and year wow. to year, what's going on. And got these people that they have some wildlife training, but they're also veterinarians and they're also experts in wildlife diseases. And that is what formulated that group that's still here today. And, and all of the state agencies contribute money every single year to keep that organization going. And they take samples for EHD and blue tongue every single year on their website, they chart out where they found it and so forth. So, and I believe that was in the sixties. Okay. So d does somebody put out a, a bulletin and say, okay, we're starting to see it over here in Georgia or, or wherever, just to alert the different DNRs. Yeah. I would say that, um, on a, on a regional scale, that would be that group Squidus located at the university of Georgia. And then also your state wildlife agency. Like I would be, if, if I was concerned, you know, William McKinley here in Mississippi would be the contact for that. Yeah. Wow. Well, it's a complicated uh, it story to yeah. what's going on here. And and uh, so I think it's very timely that we're talking about this right now. And a guy, look, Mark Jury, we talk about, we, we love oh, Mark Jury. Oh. I, I called him yesterday and Bronson, he's had a lot of experience with EHD. Oh, yeah. So we got him to record a little bit. I, uh, Richie, can we play that for the guys? All right, guys, so now, you know, we love Mark Jury. Yeah, he's one of our own, in my opinion. And he's – definitely. And he's uh, arguably maybe the best deer hunter out there. I, I tell you, I don't know anybody that kills as big a deer on a consistent basis as he does and well, does an unbelievable job not only, you know, managing the habitat but managing pressure. Uh, and, I mean, he's, he's got it down to a science. Yeah, the whole team of them, yeah, for sure. Yeah, unbelievable. So before he, we, we bring him on, I just want to say, I've known him for a long time. Lanny, you have as well. Yeah. But I can remember all these years being around him in the summertime when we were filming different shows and stuff, and he's got these relationships with, with Bucks. And, oh, yeah. And, I mean, multi Long term. That's right. With Bucks. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so the, an EHD would hit and he would lose one. Yeah. And it'd be like he losing a relative. Yeah, it would. It would hit him so hard. But I, I mean, I you think about that, though. You know, like 
as a whitetail ages, you know, you get more vested in him. And then for him just to wake up one day and not be there, it's just pretty disheartening. Yeah. So, look, can we hit the horns for Mark Drury, please? The Mark Drury in the there, house. There we go, Mark. Man. Hey, there you go, Mark. Going? Hey, guys. How are you doing today, man? Mm-hmm. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. We're always glad to have you, Mark. Yeah. So you kind of you you we're talking about EHD and and look for as long as I've known you I've I've heard you kind of fussing about it and it seems like it's affected you guys in a in a big way some years and could you just tell us your Midwest perspective on it? Man, that's a a big long long drawn out talk over a cold beer or two really. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's uh I don't know how to describe you know, what's going on up here since really my first experience with it was 1998. And, uh, actually it dates back prior to that. It was back in the mid eighties and I didn't know what had happened in our, our County there in St. Genevieve County. All I knew was that there weren't nearly as many deer, uh, one year as there had been in previous years and no one really knew what happened. And then in 98, I bought a farm up in Iowa. I actually bought it in 97 and, um, I sold mad the game call company in 97. And I was talking to Jay Gregory and Don Kiske and and they were telling me about a farm that, that could possibly be sold. And that was October of 97. And I went and looked at it. And I mean, it was the most unbelievable deer sign I'd ever seen in my life. And I bought that farm with the proceeds that I I'm, you know, had from the mad sale. And, um, I bought part of it and leased part of it. And all total, it was a couple thousand acres. And by August of the following year, I mean, they were all dead. Oh, I mean, man, it was, what a bummer. It was unbelievable. I bet I lost 90% of that herd. And it was just coincidental that I purchased it in October of 97. I couldn't even hunt it that first year because I didn't have a non-resident tag. And um, I mean, the or I had a tag, but it wasn't in that zone. That's what it was. I mean, the tur- the trails were like motocross there were rubs the size of my thigh all through this farm and and jay and don were right it was an incredible piece of property it which is now the farm that david Lindsay owns okay it's a set so i'm talking about that farm. yeah yeah, hercules Hercules. there's a little specimen right there on the wall you you've been there where that i guess that deer came from there yeah yeah, that's right hercules (laughs) okay so it's that farm he jumped off a jumped off some property they said that that's marks right there he jumped a fence and and (laughs) yeah that fence goes both ways (laughs) (laughs) but that's the story behind that piece of dirt jay and don originally told me about that they called it the miracle mile that that gravel road that now runs by uh david and jeff's house they called that the miracle mile they drive through there and there was giants you know crossing the road during the rut anyway i bought it and the next year i mean they were all dead and that was the most severe die-off i withstood up there but since then we've lost them a multitude of times we lost them in 08 we lost them big time in 12 and 13 between 12 and 13 i think we lost you know, the herd had rebuilt by then, and we, we lost 60%, 70% of the herd. Wow. And then we had another die-off in 19, and we had a die-off this past year in, in 22. And it uh, it's, just, it's just unreal to me. But <clears throat> a few things that I've learned about it, number one, I try to keep my population much lower to try and avoid those massive die-offs because it's, it spreads deer-to-deer through a, a vector, a midge fly. Whether that helps or not, I don't know, but I do, I do think it helps the overall health yeah. of the herd and helps them, you know, rebound from it. I also, in the years that I feel like I'm threatened with it, you know, like this year, we're in a major drought right now. We're so dry. It's unbelievable. The driest I've seen it since 2012. Uh, I really, really believe in, in my soul that analogic supplement gold helps. And I've, I've got a, a mix that I feed on the farm and it, it will not stop EHD, the virus itself, but it will stop off many of the secondary infections that they get because of EHD. Um, and, and on top of that, there's really, you say, well, it's, or many people say, well, it happens in a drought year. Well, I've, I've seen terrible outbreaks in wet years as well. So I think it has to do with when those midges hatch, um, how dry you are 
specifically in July and August, how wet you were throughout the spring, particularly May and June. So if you have a very wet spring, May and June, and all those water puddles fill up, and then all of a sudden you get dry in July and August, that's a terrible equation. Uh, I've seen massively dry years where we didn't have any EHD. So it's very hard to explain and very hard to predict, but it does seem to follow years where there's, or it seems to occur in years where there's quite a drought up here. Um, you know, I talked to guys north of me up in Minnesota that never get it. I talked to guys down there. You guys were talking before we went on about um, just not seeing much of it in the southeast. And um, it's a it's a real kick in the tail up here because it's something we live with day in and day out. I wonder why it's so pronounced up there where you guys live. Is, is there any insight into that? Any thoughts? I don't know other than I guess we used to not have it much and it has made its way. I guess the Southeast used to have it quite a bit. And through time, there's an immunity that has uh, developed through the herd in the Southeast. And I'm told perhaps in a hundred years or, or more, that same type of immunity will occur here in the Midwest as it occurs more and more. Uh, but I, I don't know that to be true. That's, that's some of the things that I've heard from biologists that I know. And Dr. Strickland could probably talk, you know, speak more to that. Yeah, we've, we've heard similar things as, you know, like down here, they've just historically gotten it more and therefore they're able to fend it off better. You know, they, they get it, but they live through it. Whereas, you know, up around Mark's territory, they don't seem to live through it as, as easily as they do here in the South. Mm. Um, and and, and I, I, boy, I remember that 12, 13 year watching you guys on TV and everybody else. And uh, they'd be sitting in the stand and say like, well, we lost all our deer, so we don't know if we're going to see anything this yeah. afternoon. You know, you, you saw a lot of that activity and that boy, that was sad, especially when that's you guys livelihood, you know, mm -hmm. So more, oh, it's, from what it's you brutal. used to say, that it, it really uh, has a major effect on the older deer, the older bucks. Yeah, it definitely takes out a lot of the older bucks. And it takes out, it's much greater on bucks than it is does based on what we mm. could tell. And I have a few theories about that. Like a lot of times when it occurs is in the summer, those bucks are in bachelor groups. So I think it naturally travels through that bachelor group a lot easier and quicker because they're together. Whereas your doe groups are often separated out yeah. with their fawns. So they're yeah. not together in a group that time of the year when it hits. That's my own theory. I don't know if that's true or not. That's just the way I feel about it. Um, but boy, it's, it's bad when it hits and it's so tough on the animals. I've, I've seen it kill them immediately. You find them dead in a pond and they just burn up from the inside based on what the disease does to them. And I've also seen them suffer all the way through the fall when they get all of the secondary infections that come with the HD and you'll find them dead in, you know, October, November, December, this past year, we found a bunch of dead shed bucks and I know it was leftover, you know, infections from EHD and it, it just, it wreaks havoc up through here. It's, it's devastating. But all that being said in it, in and of itself will keep the population low and the silver lining to a severe EHD outbreak about four to six, seven years later, when those fawns, the next group of fawns, grow up to be five, six-year-old deer or mature deer, they've grown up with less social stress than, say, a different pocket or a different slice in time. And when that occurs, we see our largest, most healthy, beautiful bucks that we've ever seen. So fewer deer equals healthier deer and oftentimes equals bigger deer. So there is a silver lining to it. It's not fun going through it, but fast forward a few years and you'll see some of the biggest deer you've ever seen in the Midwest after those EHD outbreaks have occurred. That that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So there's no way to say it's like a cycle. You're going to get it every third year or something. It, 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 could, it could happen back to back. There's a randomness to it and there's a pocket pocket nature to it. Like, I've seen guys have 60, 70 percent die offs and 10 miles away, you don't lose a deer. Hmm. So it's very pockety. And because of that, oh, goodness, many years ago, 12, 15 years ago, I start I, I used to own a big farm. It was it was the one that David and Jeff own now. I own like 15 farms now. Most of them are small, but they're spread out geographically 75 miles from north to south and about 30 or 40 miles east to west for that very reason as an insurance policy against um, EHD. Like a mutual fund ah, of deer property. Diversify. 
diversify. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So if they're dying off off in one pocket, you know, you're you may be good five miles away. Exactly, and and through that, through the through time, I've been watching it, and not just EHD, but just like hunting pressure and so many different variables that that determine what your overall population dynamic is and how many bucks are coming up through. It's amazing to watch one farm have an incredible year and then the next two or three years it not be that great, but yet you're hunting somewhere else. So you're giving it time for those Mm -hmm. bucks to mature. I've got a farm like that now. Last year, it was the best farm we had. And through a variety of different reasons, we lost buck after buck after buck, neighbors, bucks getting locked up, a couple wounded bucks that died later in the winter, some EHD hit. We went from like seven mature bucks on 400 acres. And this year, we think we have one or two because we lost so many of them. And, And I think that's just a slice of time last year on 400 acres. But in reality, I think we probably deal with that, these cycles all the time. I can now not pay much attention to that farm going forward because I know it needs a couple of years to heal. But it, it's amazing the dynamics of a population as you watch it through time, not just because of EHD, because natural mortality is tougher on bucks in general anyway. Hmm. So is the midge, the gnat, you know, is it actually a carrier to disease or is it biting an infected EHD deer and then transmitting it to another one? I believe that it carries it. And I think sometimes it goes from cattle to deer and then from deer to deer based on what I've read. And again, Dr. Strickland would have to speak to those types of things, but those are the, some of the things that I've read, but I believe uh, the midge is the vector that, that transmits it from mm-hmm. deer to deer or, whatever the host is to the deer. Right. So Mark, I, I hear that a lot of times these hot summer stagnant mud puddles are what the midges breed in. Uh, do, do you go to efforts to try to fill in those and, and make sure there's not any of those type scenarios on your farms? We, we do. We, you know, I've, I've run insectos, insecticidal pucks in our ponds. I've sprayed, I've done all that stuff and with not much success. Um, one thing we, we have tried to do is go to our ponds that have those, you know, they silt in through the years. So therefore, when the water recedes, you have this big flat mud area. And I've, I've gone around and, you know, try to bucket those out so the edges are more steep and you don't have that big wide swath of mud laying there when they dry out. Um, but I don't know if any of that stuff is helping or not. The one thing that I do believe in is, is supplement gold because they've got the, the equation in there to try and help them through that. Yeah, so we got the guy at Analogics that you referred to, he's a he was a veterinarian, if I'm not mistaken. So he, there's some there's certainly some science in what they're trying to do there. Well, he's a vet, and he created the initial vaccine for EHD in captive herds. I mean, he's the guy that that came up with the vaccine, Wayne Freeze. Um, but now they've given that to them in an oral form. And it's not a vaccine, but they do give them all of the health components they need to ward off those those secondary diseases and infections. That makes a lot of sense. You know, we, us as humans are becoming, uh, we're using more of those holistic type. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, you know, what you eat, it makes you more healthy and you can, you can fend things off better. That makes a lot of sense. And, I mean, you know, the, the midge lives in a a watery environment but deer also have to drink water so you know like mark was saying they they tried all these things where you decrease the slope or increase the slope to where it went from dry to wet more quickly and all these other things putting those uh bt pucks in the water that's just a mosquito dump uh and they didn't have a lot of luck with it but uh, well the first time the wind blows out of the south you get a whole new batch of midges yeah. right you know so it's so uh, they they you know it's it's hard to control mother nature it really is we try to but in reality she's just she's doing what she's done for thousands of years exactly so. All right, Mark. We sure appreciate it. Yeah, yeah all the for things what you that do. Jury yeah. Outdoors does. We we just we're so proud to be associated with you guys. That feeling's mutual. We love y'all. All right, you take care. Thank Thanks you, for your time, right. Mark. Appreciate Have it. Have a good one. Any Anytime. Bronson, you listen to him talk. He boy, he's had a lot of experience with it. Absolutely. It, all that makes sense to you. It His sure anecdotal did. evidence. He's mm-hmm. he studied it pretty hard. Yeah. Yeah. I think he's I think he's spot on. Um, I I liked some of the things he said, which uh, you know there's really no product. The 
I, I may be paraphrasing, but his words, that there's no product that's going to, with certainty, eliminate the possibility. But, but there may be some way of uh, a supplementation that it may be possible to help them live through the symptoms or, or things like that. So, you know, there, there's always that possibility. I also just wonder if... Uh, mm if you just have a healthy deer herd, you know, Toxy, like you, you were saying earlier, you know, if they're not already uh, stressed, physiologically stressed, I think it'd be the exact same way with humans. You know, we're going right. to be able to confront viruses better and our immune system deal with it better um, if we're not stressed. So, yeah, it made a lot of sense. It's a, it's a wicked way <clears throat> of nature doing things. But I do, I, I, I had to pull my headphones off for a minute so I didn't hear all that, but he may have addressed it. But I do remember him saying, uh, now I'm not speaking to that first one that was so devastating, but when he has these dives, I can remember him saying, boy, just, but the good news is two years later, the quality of our herd just blossoms a bunch. <laughs> yeah. So it's kind of like, you know, it's sad, but nature's way, if it doesn't get out of hand, might be. And isn't that helping you out? A isn't bit, that the know? same story when we deal with flooding on the Mississippi River yeah, the next year or two? You just hate to wipe <laughs> out stuff in mass like that. Yeah. It, it it did mirror what you said because you know he was trying to um, give us solid information based on just his own personal you know observations, whatever. But it was consistent, uh, pretty much. And he said. You know, as far as wet years, dry years, man, it seems to be no rhyme or reason. It seems like when we have really wet years, but then it turns off into a drought, it's the worst. Well, that would make sense mm -hmm. because you said they have to have mud, not yeah. water, yeah. and not dry ground, but mud. So if you had a really wet year to start with and then it dried out, you would have a lot more mud. And that made sense to what you were talking yeah, that about. that was consistent. Really wet mm -hmm. and then a drought. Because if you had, and then he said, we've had years when it was just super drought for a long period and we didn't have any of it. So it really, you know, mm -hmm. it it flowed, it paralleled what he was telling us earlier. So, cause you've uh, you've been around deer a long time, and and when you were doing the hunt in the country television show, you traveled all out in the Midwest and the Dakotas. Did, did any of your trips ever get impacted by EHD? <clears throat> you know, we had one in Nebraska, and we had already scheduled it. And the guy called me, said, "Look, we we've had an EHD." break out or whatever up there and he said we're not seeing many deer i said we'll come anyway i'm pretty lucky you know we had <laughs> two camera guys and two hunters and it was like i think we sat there mornings and afternoons four days and finally saw one buck that was limping and didn't look good i can remember man if that happens down home i don't know what we would do but yes it was a, that one was in nebraska and it was about 10 years ago probably in that maybe that 2012, 2011 that Mark was talking about, and it was horrific. And it took them – I think it took them a lot longer. I talked to the guy all the time. It took them two, three, four years to get back up where they wanted to offer their hunting to the general public. But mm. Toxie, in all your years uh, down in the Choctaw Bluff area, did you did – you, did you, as a kid, do you remember encountering anything like that? Not really. Uh, uh, the first time we encountered it was at a farm in Sumter County a little bit, but it was never – Real prevalent. I do remember uh, overpopulation where I grew up hunting in Clark County, and their issue was like liver flukes mm -hmm. had gotten to be so prevalent, and they were cutting livers. And I can still, I still do it now, and you see them, yeah. but not in every deer, and not right. like Swiss cheese in the liver. Mm -hmm. But that was their big thing with the overpopulated herd, and say that whatever the seventies was the just over overrun with these liver flukes. What will a liver fluke do, Bronson? Uh, it just compromises the function of yeah, the liver. Yeah, I'm sorry, I can't give you any which more. Which will kill you. I, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, I wiggled out of that one, yeah, didn't you I? Did. I was, it, it depends. Well, it right? makes sense that if you had a little bit of it, it was normal and it could live and they didn't necessarily pass it. But if it got so prevalent, liver function starts to cease. You cease. Sure. Well, yeah. So visibly from the outside, can you look at a deer and say, well, he's probably got liver flukes? I can't, no. It's no, but the ones I saw, no. I mean, occasionally you could say, and they I watched a cut up on a bunch of them, but for the most part, you don't know till you cut them open. Yeah, you just but that know. was probably an overpopulated, stressed herd, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and that was the issue was they were overpopulated and they did spread it because of overpopulation. Now, I don't know what causes the fluke or whatever, uh, but 
that's the one thing I do remember they were worried about, and it was killing some deer. I don't recollect, you know, mm. I've I've killed deer that had the sloughed hooves in the mm-hmm. past, but I don't recollect ever having, you know, a couple of years where you never see any deer or oh, anything no. like never that. Never that, no. never that, mm-hmm. no. You know, we hear about people finding a dead deer in a pond, you know, and then you get it tested or whatever, and it is, in fact, EHD, but... Yeah, I've never noticed a, a serious die-off. Now, I'm familiar with, with two properties from here in Mississippi last year, and one was very close to where we're at now. Uh, I think they documented 15 or 16 deer in ponds and creeks on this uh, 800-ish acre uh, property, and and one down south, uh, south of Meridian, same thing. Uh Noticed a couple deer during their camera surveys were in really poor condition, and I mean really poor condition. Uh, and then they got to looking more, started walking the creeks and so forth, and found, I don't know, eight or ten more. So, But we just don't, kind of like where we started, but we don't see that 50, 60, 70 percent die-off. So again, we're confronted with it every single year, and some years a strain of it may be worse or that may be a, a, a blue tongue strain versus the EHD strain, but it's just not going to devastate a, a southern deer herd like it will in the Midwest. Well, hopefully in time, the, the Midwest herd will become more accustomed to it. Yeah. The worst thing in our world is like you've, you've got a place or even a club or whatever, you've got this certain deer that you've let grow up, and then you find them dead because yeah. of it. That's probably more yeah. likely to be your heartbreak than losing too much of your deer herd in most places. I don't. Right. Most places probably don't shoot enough deer. Right. You know, anyway. So. Ross, you've done a great job explaining this. I've actually learned several things about this that I didn't know. But is there anything else that – is there a question that uh, you said, boy, these knuckleheads, I hope they'll ask me this. Yeah, he's been answering uh, entomology questions and virology. <laughs> poorly, all, all that. poorly. Um, I, I don't think so. I, I think you've covered it right well, very well, at least the stuff I'm, I'm used to, to, to answering. I think you've covered it all. So, so yeah, I just want to make sure that is there even anything that you can do as a – landowner as a club member you know making decisions about your area and your deer herd i mean i guess what you're telling us is don't worry about it so much in the south but in other areas is there is there anything at all you know to can you watch for can you help it i mean it's almost like I, I, nobody wants to lose 90 percent, and that's not healthy but it's almost like you just can't change what Mother Nature is going to do sometimes, and so yeah. uh, maybe there's not. I mean, I don't, other than you know, yeah. someone developing a vaccine. Think yeah. about yeah. that for a second, Bronson. I'm going to look at Cuz, and Cuz, you're on the board of the National Deer Association. That's right, formerly QDMA. It, it, did they uh, have any kind of information they put out that guys could go search for and, and learn more about? Yeah, they they got some of the best biologists around, Kip Adams and those kind of guys. They're, they're their main focus right now, I'm assuming, is CWD. They do so much. They're 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 way down those rabbit holes right now. There's EHD information on there, but uh, I don't think they have they they don't know any more than. Have you experienced you know. it on your farm? But uh, North the only there? thing I have on my farm that kills deer is TMG, which is too many grandkids. <laughs> <laughs> they will absolutely wear them out. But I have never seen any EHD out there. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure any of the land-grant universities like Mississippi State or uh, any of these uh, places like QDMA could share publications mm-hmm. with you that you can learn from. The, the way I'm going to manage the disease is I'm going to manage my deer herd so that it's not overpopulated, that my deer are in good condition. I'm going to manage the habitat, uh, that my deer herd is thriving and growing and managed. And then, you know, if, if we have an outbreak of EHD, that's about like trying to avoid, predict and avoid a tornado. I mean, it's, it's just going to happen, and there's not much we can do about that. Yeah. But the thing about EHD, remember, it's, it's a, it's a one-year cycle. You get to start over the next year. And now you even have some immunity to it. So that year is going to really stink. And depending on the population dynamics around you, it may take, you know, three years to get back, like you were saying, because three to five. But for most people around here, literally next year, you're not going to know you, you, you had an outbreak. 
That's good. Now, I want to ask a question. And and is there anything going on with the wild hogs in the USDA that you can talk about? I, I hear rumors that there's some trials on some poisons, and uh, it's all rumor. But it sounds very encouraging too. You may not be able. To, I'm sure you're in the know. You may not be able to talk about it. But is there anything that you can say? It it's uh, referring to toxicants. I think that's what you're you're talking about. Yeah, that that is still being researched. Um, it's just the devil is in the details on non-targets. Yeah, um, uh, this one particular uh, toxicant, the, the sodium nitride and so forth, it is very, very effective. Zero question of how effective it is. It's how do you deliver it in a way that is most likely going to kill hogs and not the non-targets. Yeah, That's uh, what makes it so difficult yep. in getting it registered and licensed. Imagine the sensitivity we have, I've Oof. heard y'all talk about, with, with turkeys. Oof. You kill a sounder of pigs, but also kill... 15 turkeys or something like that. Yep. That, that hurts one. feelings. Yeah, one non-target. I mean, it's yeah. literally, you just have to have that. From, from a legality standpoint, I get it. And say the non-target's not even a hunting spe- I don't care. It's not fair to that other non-target species. Yeah. So, yep. And if I you're in bear it. country, it makes it even more difficult. Coming up with a delivery device that a bear can't get into is tough. I I guess what? Bear is, country's yeah. changing because yeah. we actually yeah. saw one here for the first time. Neil saw the first one documented in Clay County yeah. about two years ago, and for sure. You know, mm-hmm. That's exciting. So, but, well, so, I, I, you know, when you know something, please, get, we, we, we have, you, you seem to find your way over here pretty fast. If you need, <laughs> yeah, and if they need, like, if there's, like, a research test facility needed and they need a volunteer landowner, just go ahead and count me. I'll sign up yeah. right now, so ahead of time. I, yeah. And I've got plenty to sample. <laughs> Dudley, did you do a, a, any rapid fire for Bronson? I didn't this time. Okay. We do have one trivia question we could ask you. Oh, boy. And one of our uh, listeners could win a prize based on your knowledge here. This one's it's, it's just going to be easy for you, I think. Richie, oh. can you help? Well, All right. Here we are. Uh, you're playing for Fields Bay VT. Uh, so a listener there, and the prize is a Groundhog Max. Uh, well, so, that Groundhog Max, is, it goes behind an ATV. Have you all seen these things? Just a little small disc, and then the weight... When you get on the ATV, it kind of pushes it down in the ground. A great way to easily create a disturbance or, or disc up a little plot. Uh, it can be used for all kinds of things, but it's just so convenient. Uh, when you're not in the mood to, if you don't have a tractor or if you're not in the mood to take one implement off and put another one on, you can just put it on your bike, go, go to town. Groundhogmax.com. We need to get you one of those, Bronson. I'll take two. Yeah. (laughs) Okay, and so we're playing for – the guy's name is Fields Bay VT. Is that for Virginia Tech, do you think? He's a Hokie? I don't know. I saw that. Vermont. Yeah, it could be Vermont. Could be Vermont, yeah. Mm -hmm. Look at Cush. Mm -hmm. There we go. Hey, you never know. All right. All right, Cush, you can help him out here too. So, true or false, do baby owls, owlets, commonly sleep on their – Stomachs because they can't support their weight of their enormous heads. True or false? Hey, why did y'all have an enormous head question? <laughs> <laughs> when, I'm, when I'm on the panel down here. I'm, so, crying, I'm crying foul. No I'm, I'm going uh, <laughs> to point that to Bobby on that because he, he he helps out with the questions. Yeah, well, you. just trying to stump Bronson. That's... Yeah, I, I'm going to say um, I'm going to say false. Or maybe I should say true. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Yeah, according to Wikipedia, they do. Mm. Yeah, one of those did you know kind of scenarios that when they're very small, their heads are so heavy. Hey, I could answer that from just personal experience. But <laughs> I didn't want to jump in on top of. Is that, that what you tell all your students? Is to look everything up on Wikipedia? Yeah, that's that's the source that's right what I there. Thought. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. Good one. Yeah, that was a good one. So, uh, Bayfields VT, get in touch, and uh, uh, we'll get you uh, that Groundhog Max sent to you. <laughs> we need to get some door prizes from Mississippi State, maybe a, uh, some tuition or some books or something. How about a cowbell? I, I, uh, yeah. How about a cap or a cowbell? I can probably come up with that better than tuition. <laughs> okay. The, uh, the tree ID books, I wonder if those still exist. Yeah. 
Yeah. You, I want to compete for one of those. All right. It would be good to have. That would be awesome. Mm-hmm. So uh, when we look around, we always, Bronson, we end this thing, You usually, we usually ask, what did we learn? I had no idea that this started kind of in the south and in I, I don't know the right word, but somehow it travels north. I, mm-hmm. I didn't know it, it, that's how it worked. Mm-hmm. Learned that. I also learned the word pockety. Mark said <laughs> that. I didn't know that. Well, that works. But Dudley, what about you? Well, uh, you know, to mention another podcast that we've had, uh, Nature is Metal, yes. but uh, there is a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, you know. Uh-huh. Uh, it's sad, uh, but it's it's helping the population thrive for the few years after that and uh hopefully in time they'll develop more immunities to it more tolerance because yeah i heard the best analogy ever when dr bronson said you you know i I take care of these deer you can do the habitat you can do the herd but it's just like a tornado if mother nature puts her mind to it ain't nothing you can do and you shouldn't worry about that because there's nothing you can do that was a great analogy that's what stuck out to me Mm -hmm. Yep. Do some squirrel hunting instead. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, years. there's going to be people offer up things, and as long as you're not damaging anything else or hurting anything else and you want to give it a shot, sure, I mean, whatever. But just be careful because as far as science has proven, there is no, no way to stop it or treat it or otherwise. So, uh, like, first thing out of his mouth when he got through habitat, Herds under the carrying capacity, a healthy herd will do more than anything. Yeah. Yep. Well, uh, Bronson, that, that, that's what you guys preach all the time. Let's, we, we don't talk about growing big deer. We talk about growing a healthy deer herd. A healthy, mm-hmm. thriving herd. Yeah. And then let the chips fall where they may. Mm-hmm. That sounds good. Well, does anybody else have anything to add? Toxie, you look like you're fixing to bolt out the door as soon as we get Do this one over. Cuz, thank you for being here. Hey, I appreciate it. Like I said, I was delivering barbecue sauce and got lassoed by the big guy and was glad because I learned something in here today, I can promise you. This podcast is way different than our other one, A Fistful of Dirt. I just had a guy on there, and we talked about barbecue sauce for an hour and ten minutes. Well, that's an incredibly... Uh, <laughs> Good subject to talk about. It is. Yeah. Yeah. He, brought, he brought me some barbecue sauce from that guy, and ironically, I just had a fetish over the weekend for getting back into cooking barbecue. Bought some ribs, bought a Boston butt, was fixing them, and I was unhappy with my choices at the grocery store, wondering what to do, and he just literally out of the blue said, hey, I got you some barbecue, homemade barbecue sauce. Divine intervention. It was. Yeah, yep. it's, it's good stuff. He'll be my guest next <clears throat> week. I'm firing up my grill tonight. Yep. Is that right? Wow. Yep. Bronson, maybe you'll get a call. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. I mean, I like a rib every now and again, too. Just so. one rib? Mm. What what movie was that? Anyway. <laughs> so, Bronson, where can guys follow you? Uh, Dr. Bronson Strickland, you're at uh, the Mississippi State University of Extension Department. Yeah, just uh, MSU Deer Lab on all the social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, we're really building our YouTube channel, MSU That's Deer Lab TV. Awesome. So we're putting a lot of videos on there as well so uh and a website so literally msu deer lab in google and those platforms will pop up is it true that you stay up at night answering the questions on that uh, that page personally it, it is true i have stayed up some nights yeah i can't do it every night no. i mean i gotta sleep sometime but okay. yeah i do that in the evening i sure do can i say something about mississippi state sure. it has nothing to do with ehd or any of this other stuff but while bronson's sitting here uh I made a post the other day about my youngest grandson being AKA cranky, who was diagnosed dyslexic when he was five or six years old. They thought it was a behavioral problem. Lucky those teachers caught him. He went to Mississippi state. They have the best program ever. He's, he went two days a week for five years and never missed a session. And now he's on the AB honor roll and we were they those teachers he was the second kid to go all the way through and they had a graduation party for him over there the other day that's incredible mississippi state is a special place it really is great Mm -hmm. how about that yeah uh one of the smartest people i know is is one of my cousins oh i thought you were gonna say i thought you were gonna say bronson and he is extremely dyslexic yeah. So uh, oh, yeah. my mom, my mom is different. I can tell you that. But he is. He my is, mom's pretty smart. She's severely dyslexic. Yeah. Actually, it's wow. a unique yep. thing. But yeah. you know, we all got to know everybody, mm-hmm. and we were. It's just an amazing place. That's good to hear. Yeah, it's good. It's a good place. So. 
That is. Bronson, we don't hear that much good stuff about you, but we hear a lot about <laughs> Mississippi State. So mm-hmm. That's fair. Yeah. <laughs> what about Steve Damaris? How's he? he? He's doing fantastic. Yeah. Uh, he's been uh, traveling around. He was out west last week at a CWD conference, so we had some research we were sharing with that and learning and uh, – uh, so he got to go out west, and you stayed in the office. Well, I, I did go to the Gulf of Mexico. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. yeah. Right. No, but he's doing great. Thanks for asking. Good, mm-hmm. good, good, good. Well, we sir, we, we appreciate you traveling over. This has been informative. I think yeah, we all I, learned I just, something. In closing, I'd be, encourage all the people that follow us, and because um, I mean, I read the remarks. People love getting information about working on their place more than anything we do. Any entertainment value we bring them or anything. So if you're searching through everything we have, and we have a lot, and especially on Miles Hill Go, it's unbelievable. Don't miss out on going to all the stuff he mentioned at Mississippi State because it's coming straight from the horse's mouth science-wise from them. And uh, they've been behind the scenes, top flight, whitetail, you know, university for a very, very long time. Yeah. Very long time. Thank you, Toxie. Now, Appreciate you. Hey, it's true. What, what mm-hmm. Joe Namath said that about football. Hey, if it's if it's true, it ain't bragging. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. All right, that's good. Well, we we we're really proud of what y'all are doing, and you and we as we travel around, we really do hear a lot of people in other states are bragging mm-hmm. about you guys. Well, thanks so they, much. They really are. That's very, very gratifying well to of. hear. I appreciate that. Yeah, sure thing. All right. Well, uh, I guess that's about it. Why don't you say goodbye, Dudley? Goodbye, Dudley. Thanks for tuning in to this week's episode of the Gamekeeper Podcast. And be sure to tune in again. Subscribe to Gamekeeper Farming for Wildlife magazine. And don't miss the Mossy Oak Properties Fistful of Dirt podcast with my good buddy, Ronnie Cuz Strickland.